Hello, welcome to this week's program of Study the Word. This is sponsored every week by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Geyer Road in Kirkwood, Missouri. We're glad you've joined us, folks. In just a few moments, another Bible question has come our way, and we will provide the Bible answer. Do you have a question on your mind? We'll use it on this program. You can call us or text us at that number. Leave it on voicemail if you call it in, and we'll use it. We leave the uh, website up there for a little bit. I'll put it up later in the program. But go ahead and check out our website because we upload all our past TV programs. And you know that that would be a lot of Bible questions that you can scan through to see what the Bible answer is. I'll put that number up, as I said a moment ago, a little bit longer at the end of the program because every week we offer some free Bible study helps for you, our viewers. And... Matter of fact, our question today centers around one of our viewers who requested the home Bible study course and went ahead and completed it because there's a couple of lessons in that program that deals with the subject of salvation, how to become a Christian. And the person that contacted us said, you know, I'm not sure that my baptism was valid because I was sprinkled as a young child. So what that did is it provoked the, this, this kind of a question, and that is, what would be considered an improper baptism? I think it's good for us to look at because, you know, most religious groups teach baptism. Could they possibly be teaching it wrong? Well, it can, and it continues to happen, and but it's nothing new, folks. It happened in the it happened in the first century also. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to a passage over in Acts chapter 19, first of all, to show you that it's possible that somebody who's very sincere and wants to please the Lord could be baptized, but it didn't accomplish anything. Let's read it. So I'm over here in Acts, the 19th chapter, and we notice it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, he came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples, some learners. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, We have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now that caused Paul to think for a moment. So he, he, he asked this question in verse 3. Into what then were you baptized? Well, they said, into John's baptism. Well, then Paul said, Well, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, But, but they were just immersed. That's what John's baptism was. So, why did they have to get baptized again? Because they had not done what the Lord had asked, because when Jesus died, and when Jesus went back to heaven, and the commission was to given to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We know from Ephesians chapter 4, he mentions in verse 5, there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. There's not two, there's not three. There's not many different kinds. Now, we read about John's baptism, but what Paul was telling these people, John's baptism is no longer valid. Now that Jesus has come and Jesus has died, you and I need to be baptized into Christ. And we'll talk more about that as our lesson winds down this morning. But we hope you'll stay tuned as we learn what would be considered an improper baptism? Well, this passage here in Acts chapter 19 gives us a little bit of an insight, and that is you need to know who Jesus is. You need to believe in Jesus. That will qualify you because they didn't know about Jesus. As well, they didn't know about him, but well, now they know about Jesus, so that'll suffice because they've been baptized already. Well, no, this is telling us they needed to understand that ahead of time to know the purpose and to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20 says, 
baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptized for a particular reason that, that we will expand on. So you have to understand there are, there are prerequisites. So that would obviously uh, eliminate the idea of infant baptism because they didn't understand. They can't under, an infant cannot under, understand who Jesus is. And a person might say, well, they can be taught about Jesus a little bit later, Chuck. We'll, we'll baptize them now. And of course, we're going to talk about sprinkling in a moment, whether that's valid. But the point is made, they'll say, well, we're, we're going to baptize them now, and then later on, they'll learn about Jesus. Well, okay, if they learn about Jesus later on, what are they going to say? Are they going to say, well, I've been baptized, so now that I know about Jesus, I don't have to do it again. Well, what about those in Acts chapter 19? They were just immersed in water. They were baptized. Okay, they didn't understand what they were doing, just like a child wouldn't understand what they were doing. And now Paul says, yeah, but you didn't understand what you're doing. And then they immediately were baptized in the name of Jesus. They had to do it. Why? Because back then, they only got wet. They weren't converted. The point we're trying to make here is there are pre-wet requisites that have to be in place before somebody can be scripturally baptized. And we know that's true from what we read over in Acts, the 8th chapter. Acts chapter 8. And what I'm trying to get us to see, folks, is that we don't want to be so quick to say, ah, it doesn't matter. I've been baptized. I've been baptized. And when we say, yeah, but let's look, look at it a little closer. Why were you? And they say, well, it doesn't really matter. Or they might say, well, I learned afterwards. Now, that doesn't work, folks. And we need to see the danger in this. And we're over here in the Acts, the 8th chapter. And this is a passage we often turn to to show that there are things that have to be in place before somebody is baptized. Because we read here in Acts, the 8th chapter, that here's a person who is taught about Jesus in verse 35. It says, Philip opened his mouth, the preacher, the evangelist, Philip, beginning at the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So people need to know about Jesus like those in Acts 19. And as they came to, to some water, the eunuch said, well, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, you would think Philip would say, well, nothing hinders you. You just get baptized. And then, you know, you learn later on what it's all about. No, no. That's what the question is today. What would be considered an improper baptism? Well, one that got baptized when at the time they really didn't understand why they were doing it, what the meaning of it was, what the purpose was. If a person doesn't understand that, they weren't baptized. Now let's move on. We'll see what the conditions that were given here. When he said, what hinders me, the preacher said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, we need to believe in him. That's what the commission was in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, with the mouth of confession is made unto salvation, this individual here had to confess his faith in Jesus. And when he confessed it, what did the preacher do? Well, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, went down into the water, and he baptized him. So that's going to help us deal with another improper way of baptism, and that is sprinkling or pouring. No, that's, that's not a valid baptism, folks. How do I know that? Because this word baptism here, it's, it's a, a transliterated word, baptizo, which means to immerse. That's what you do. You have to bury somebody. And that gets us to the meaning of baptism, which we're going to look at. We're going to be over in Romans chapter 6 in just a few moments where it talks about how that baptism is a burial. You know, you, you can't go to a graveyard today and, and see a, a grave with an arm sticking out. No, because then they really wouldn't be buried. So sprinkling is not in the scriptures. It's not baptism. Pouring water over somebody is not a baptism. Being immersed, which 
what John did, right? John immersed in water too, because that's what the word baptism means. There was the baptism of John, and now there's this baptism of Christ. And so you need to understand what you're, you're doing, which we already dealt with, but it has to be immersion went down into the water and he baptized him and so when we when we think more and more about this concept of baptism we need to make sure that we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it now the why is really important here folks because this is what gets this is what gets missed this is something that we have taught on this program time and time again because like i say most religious groups teach baptism but they're not teaching bible baptism so what do you mean chuck well they're just causing people to get wet why is that well like those in acts chapter 19 they just got wet because they didn't understand what they were doing and a lot of people today don't understand why they're doing it when they had it done so what do you mean chuck i can't tell you folks how many people I have sat down with in their home or at the church building in a place that we've studied over the years and I'll ask people have you been baptized and they'll say we sure have I'll say well can can you tell me that whole process and they said well they they said they would say well I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and now that as a child of God I was taught that it's very important because the Bible teaches it in so many places There's over a hundred verses in the New Testament that mention baptism. He says, I was taught that it was very important for me to get baptized. And so they would say, now that I was a Christian, we set up a time where a bunch of us uh, were baptized and we had, a, we had a ceremony about that. I said, okay. And so then we would look at the scriptures and see what the Bible had to say about that. And one thing that we would learn quickly is that over there in Acts chapter 2, this is the first sermon after Jesus went back to heaven, and we notice here that as they were preached the word of God, that they were pricked in their heart in verse 37, realizing that they had crucified the Son of God, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now let's think about this. Let's not pass over this too quickly. See, the purpose is to have the remission of sins. Now if a person doesn't understand what they're doing, their sins are not remitted. If a person is just being sprinkled or water poured on them, that's not baptism, so they haven't had their sins remitted. If a person doesn't believe who Jesus Christ is, they're unwilling to confess, and like this verse says, if you're not willing to repent, turn about and follow Jesus, well, then the baptism isn't going to work. And so what we're reading here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, that it's for, just like believing is for, the remission of sins, so is repentance for the remission of sins, and baptism for the remission of sins. They all have to be working together. You can't have a person saying, I believed, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, my sins are gone, I'm saved now, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to go and get baptized. Well, no. Well, that, that's kind of silly. Why would you even need to get baptized if your sins are already washed away? Because, well, well, the Bible says I need to get baptized. Yeah, but why does a person get baptized? We're reading here, it's for the remission of sins, folks. And so if, if somebody, anyone, has been taught, now I was, I came out of that false religion, but I can remember being taught, you know, Chuck, now that you're a Christian, you've been born again, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you know, you should get baptized. And so we set an appointment up three months uh, down the road, and a bunch of us gathered at a lake, and they baptized us. And they said, this is going to be an outward sign of an inward grace. The only problem is the Bible doesn't teach that. Christians don't get baptized. You get baptized to become a Christian. And that's why we spent a whole program. You can go back in the archives and check that out on our website. We did a whole program 
on the conversion of Saul, many people have been told about his conversion from Acts chapter 9. I can remember in the religious group I was a part of, they would put the title up on there saying, Saul saved on the road to Damascus. Was Saul saved on the road? Well, you go back to Acts chapter 9, and when, when Jesus appeared to him, and he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. He said, well, what do you want me to do? Go in the city and I'll be told what you need to do. And then in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, a preacher comes to him and says, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Can you be a Christian? Can you be a faithful Christian and still be in your sins? No, the reason we become Christians is to have the remission of sins. That's why Jesus died, folks. In Matthew chapter 26, Verse 28, this is on the night that Jesus was going to be crucified. He says, this is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So right there we understand there's no power in the water, folks. The power is in the blood. The power is in his word. We have confidence in that. And this is why we go to this passage in Romans chapter 6, I mentioned a moment ago that we were going to look at, because this clearly shows us, folks, the purpose of it. And this is why infant baptism doesn't work. This is why sprinkling and pouring doesn't work. This is why not understanding before a person gets baptized means it's invalid, that they just got wet. Because notice what Paul says here. In Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, Paul said, Do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried, and we talked about that, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if, now you notice that if, because what if you don't? He says here, if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. What if you haven't died? You're not freed from sin. How do you die? You put to death the old man. And see, that's why he compared it. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He resurrected. What do we do? Well, we have to be, we have to die. We have to put to death the old man. What do you do with a dead body? You bury it. That's what he said here. We're buried with Christ. So we go down the watery graves of baptism. And then he says, what? We rise up in newness of life, putting off the old man and putting on the new man. So for those who say, you know what, I was a Christian and then I got baptized. Well, you're telling everybody that when you were a Christian, that's still the old man. You're still a servant of sin. Well, no, no, you, no, that's not the way it works. A person needs to understand that when you have things set up where you believe who Jesus is, you're willing to confess him and repent. People who were at that stage were baptized immediately. There was no appointments, certainly not three months uh, down the road. It's not a ceremony. Matter of fact, you can go over to the uh, 16th chapter of Acts and find a family who, who were baptized at midnight. Well, why didn't they just wait? What's the rush? Everybody who becomes a child of God were baptized immediately. Now, it's just, the emphasis should not be just on baptism, folks. People say that, does all I have to do need to be baptized? Well, no. If the prerequisites are not there, if we don't believe in Jesus, baptism is not more important than belief. Baptism is not more, than, more important than confessing or repenting. But all these things are necessary. Now, what happens after a person is baptized? Guaranteed heaven? Of course not. Revelation 2.10 we need to be faithful until death. But we need to first get into Christ. We need to get out of danger, have our past sins washed away. And then we are trying to live faithfully for him 
serving him as all the other programs we talk about how are we to worship how are we to treat other people and there's just so many things to learn but what we're dealing with today is what can what would be considered an improper baptism and we've demonstrated that there are all kinds of quote baptisms that are not scriptural which means people only got wet they've been deceived they've been told things that are not in the scriptures this program challenges all kinds of doctrines. That's why we get all kinds of Bible questions from viewers with all kinds of backgrounds because they've been taught a lot of different things and they want to know what the Bible has to say. Now, you might disagree with what we talked about today. You might say, Chuck, I was sprinkled, I'm okay. I had water poured on me. I, had, I was baptized as a baby. Um, I was a Christian and then I got baptized. You might just say, I just disagree with what you talked about. Folks, you don't have to challenge me. Challenge this. I'm just trying to teach you what the Word of God has to say. I hope nobody ever asks a question for this program this way. I hope they don't say, Chuck, what do you think about this? What do you think about uh, what, what's improper baptism? It doesn't matter what I think. I'll tell you what God says about it. And you need to follow Him. Listen to the Lord. And that's what Paul was doing in Acts chapter 19, encouraging these people to listen to the truth. And when they heard the truth, they immediately were baptized properly. And that's what happened this past week. We had, well, by the time this airs, I try to do this ahead of time. So a couple weeks ago, when you have a person who, who was taught over the years that it's okay to do it this way, and after reading the scriptures and studying it, called up and said, you know what? I need to do this properly. I want to be saved. And then I need to live faithfully. And folks, if we can help you in any way, we'd love to talk with you. Maybe you say, you know, I, maybe my ba baptism is valid, but I just want to be sure. Can we talk about it? Let's do it. We sit around the table and we'll talk about um, what you did and, and we'll open up the scriptures and make sure it's in harmony with this. Because... Jude 3 says there's a common salvation, folks. Common, which means everybody became a Christian. Read it in the New Testament. Everybody became a Christian the exact same way. After Jesus died and went back to heaven, it was common. And so we need to examine ourselves. We're told that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine ourselves whether we're in the faith. There's nothing wrong with... with um, testing ourselves, making sure if we're right. You see, it's a win-win situation if I study to make sure, because if I study and I found out I'm right, oh, peace of mind. If I study and I find out I'm wrong, well, I can't admit I'm wrong unless I found out what is right, and if I found out what is right, I can make the change. So it's a win-win situation. It's vital, folks, that we rightly divide the Word of God, that we understand what it says on this very important subject of the plan of salvation. And let's not be deceived because of the wiles of the devil that are out there. All right. Having said all of that, this is the time in our program where we offer those free Bible study helps. And the first thing is, is this Know Your Bible six-lesson Bible study course. The things we talked about today are in this course, lesson number three and lesson number six. This first lesson starts us with some fundamentals about understanding the Bible. Free. I'll send you this first lesson with a return envelope. And after you've answered the questions, it encourages you to open up your Bible. After you answer them, send it back. I'll look it over and we'll return it to you so you can hold on to it and we'll put lesson number two in there. Like I said, there's only six lessons. It doesn't take you long to, um, to complete, but again, there's no time limit. You work at it at your own speed in the comfort of your own home. What a way to study. And so if that's of interest to you, go ahead and leave your name and your address. You can text it, but if you leave it on voicemail, be sure to spell sometimes the street names or even the, your own name uh, might be hard to, to hear. So spelling it out is always a big help, but we'll get that first lesson in the mail for you uh, 
the very next day. So please keep that in mind. Secondly, we're having a lot of people request the, the pamphlets, the two pamphlets, they say, just go ahead and throw that in with my first lesson, Chuck. Um, 40 things. Here's a list of 40 things that people think the Bible teaches, but it doesn't. And I'm sure you'll read that and go, well, man, our church teaches that. And then this other pamphlet says, 30 things that are in the Bible that some people say are not. People say, well, Chuck, I've been told that's not in the Bible. And you can open this up and you can look at those verses and say, wow, it is in the Bible. Why did they say that? Why? I'm not. These don't tell you why people tell you things are in the Bible, but they're not. And it doesn't tell you why people say it's not in the Bible, but it is. But these are things that you can study on your own and look at. So if you would like those, no charge for any of this stuff, please just go ahead and request that. We also offer our weekly bulletin, a couple of short articles. If you would like to be put on the mailing list, we'll go ahead and do that and you can receive that in the mail every couple of weeks with a couple of bulletins in there. And it just encourages you to study more of God's Word. No charge for any of that. And then as I was mentioned in a moment ago, but more specifically, if you would like a face-to-face -face Bible study, and we've had people request that. It's great. We, we sit around the kitchen table. We just study the Word of God together. Um, I had a lady call up the other day and wanted that. And I bring somebody with me so you won't feel uncomfortable. But if you would like a one-on-one -on -one class, we'll set it up at a time that fits into your schedule during the week, mornings, afternoons, or evenings, or on the weekends, um, at your home or at the church building, um, coffee shop. Or, if you don't like that one-on-one, -on -one, you can join a larger class that we have at the, at the church building at a certain time. Uh, maybe that works best for you. But, but please, if you're interested in having your own personal study where we can open up the scriptures together, just answer those questions. And even if you don't have any questions, I have a series of lessons we can go through where I can teach you the whole Bible in three short 40-minute classes. And we can set that up weekly if you would like. So if you're interested in that, please call and let us know and we'll get back in touch with you. So finally, folks, if you're ever in the Kirkwood area, please come by and say hello. I talked with somebody the other day who's been watching the TV program for a long time and he's actually been encouraging others to watch. He said, I'm going to come by and visit with you. Please do that. We've had a number of TV viewers pop by there at, at our Kirkwood congregation when the church assembles every Sunday morning at 9.30 for a Bible study, 10.20 for our worship, lasts about an hour, and then Sunday evenings from 5 to 6, another hour of worship, and every Wednesday from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And we have classes for all age groups, so we'd love for you to bring the family. Uh, we wouldn't expect anything out of you. Just come observe. Participate in our worship service. We, we're not going to solicit funds from you. We're not going to put any pressure on you. You'll just be greeted with a smile and a warm handshake. And, be, and thank you for coming to be with us. Folks, I hope you'll tell other people about this program. Tune in next week. You know what we're going to do. We're going to open up our Bibles together. And we're going to study the Word. Thank you for being with us. And have yourselves a great day.